So, uh, good morning. Good morning. I'm, uh, I'm seeing spinning up here on my, uh, my device guys in the back, so you might have to help me out. Uh, did anybody, while the kids were singing, did any of the rest of you go like this and try to count down? <laughs> I did and failed miserably, so they've already got one up on me so far this morning. Well, uh, it's good to be back. It's good to have Jake and Candace and the kids back. We're glad you're here. Uh, did, anyone, uh, did anyone read the book of Jonah this past week? Oh, I see some hands. Wonderful. I hope, I hope when you did that uh, there were some more insights. I, my guess is many of you have already read the book. Uh, it wasn't the first time through. Um, I realize every time I go through something in Scripture, the Lord uh, gives, me, uh, gives me more than I'd never noticed before. So I don't think you can ever read through a passage enough to, um, to get tired of it or not to learn something new when you go through it. But uh, we did, uh, you know, we covered the first two chapters last week, didn't we, Jonah? And uh, I was hoping that I would be able to, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, Lucas, I'm not connected. If there's any way that you can do some magic in the back to connect me, that would be wonderful. And see if that will go. When we, uh, when we left Jonah last week, at the end of chapter 2, I think the big fish had just spit him out. Does that sound about right to everyone? And I did notice that many of you, when you uh, were walking out and we were chatting after the service, one of the thoughts that hit me, or that hit as we chatted more often than not was, what do you think Jonah looked like after three days in the belly of that fish? Yeah. <laughs> Look and smell, yes, I, I'll be honest, I, I'm not sure I know, and I'm also not sure I want to know, right? Um, so, pretty interesting to think about. I, uh, I wonder if he went home and cleaned up and got a change of clothes, probably. Uh, so, we left him there, and uh, you know, one of the things that, that really kind of stuck out to me at the end of that, and thinking about going forward today does it make you stop to think about how God uses His control of His creation to get our attention sometime? Uh, you know, in this case, He used uh, a great storm and a great fish to capture Jonah's attention. Uh, there are some other places in Scripture where God uses those kinds of things to capture attention. In, uh, in Numbers chapter 22... God uses a talking donkey to capture the attention of a man named Balaam. Warns Balaam not to go and bless, or not to go against the people of Israel. Um, at the end, it didn't work out real well for Balaam. He didn't end up listening the way he should have, but the donkey got his attention. I don't know about you, it would have probably perked up my ears a little bit. Uh, in Exodus chapter 3, do you remember the burning bush? You think that got Moses' attention? In fact, it said as he walked by, something caught his attention, and as he turned, he went, how is this bush burning but not burning up? So God used a burning bush to capture His attention. And then if you think about Jesus' ministry, He turned water into wine, He walked on the water, He fed 5,000. And did he do those things just to show off? In each case, he did that to capture the attention of the people around him because he had something important to say to those people. And I believe, as I mentioned, that I think that's why God did such a dramatic thing to Jonah. It got his attention. And... Um, Next time, as you read through Scripture, I would just challenge you to pay attention to how, how does God do things to capture attention? Not because the thing is so important, but because the message that follows is so important. Mm -hmm. 
So um, I think we just need to read a bit. If uh, you have your Bibles open to uh, Jonah chapter 3, uh, please follow along. Um, I didn't do this last week. I decided maybe I should have. We're just going to read the entire chapter together to start, and then we'll come back and take a look at it. So Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on ashes. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. So we, um, thanks guys. So Jonah spits, gets spit up on the Sea of the Mediterranean. And uh, you saw this last week, those that were here. He still is 500 miles from where he needs to go. But, do you, um, do you think it's amazing that God said a second time to go? God gave him a second chance, didn't He? And this time Jonah did what he was asked to do. Do you think it's amazing that God gives any of us a second or a third or a fourth or whatever point we're at in our process? Uh, I think it's amazing that he does that for us as well. And uh, I have heard that, um, in fact, I listened to a podcast that talked about Jonah being a surprising book, all the surprising things that happened in Jonah. And as I read it, ironic came to mind. It's, it's ironic, all these things that go on in the book of Jonah. But I think I have come to the conclusion that I like a, another word even better to describe this book. And that word is amazing. So, let's just think about these. First, do you, I think it's amazing how God used that great storm and a great fish to get Jonah's attention. I think um, it's amazing that God gives Jonah a second chance. I think it's amazing that Nineveh repents in such a dramatic way. And in the next chapter, in chapter 4, I think it's amazing the way Jonah responds to that repentance. Right? With all of that, though, I am convinced that the most amazing thing in this book is the incredible love and compassion that God shows to those, even those that reject Him. And I think you're going to see that over and over in these next two chapters this morning. So as we go through this morning, look for amazing things as we look at Jonah together. So, I don't know how we exactly got there. Uh, 500 miles back in those days was probably a month-long journey. And as we mentioned, maybe he stopped by the house and got a new change of clothes and took a bath or something. But at some point, Jonah made it to Nineveh. 
And the, uh, the passage calls it a, an exceedingly great city. Um, we're not sure exactly how big it is. It talks about a three days walk. We don't know if that meant a three days walk around it or through it, or it just took three days to visit all the good stuff there. But it was a large city. Um, and in fact, um, at the end of this book, we will find out that it probably had at least, at least several hundred thousand people in it, maybe over a million people in this city. And then, in verse 4, it says, And the first day, or on one day's journey in, he walked into the city and started to preach on the first day. And um, in some ways, I'm a little bit jealous of Jonah, because this is his message. If I count right, there's eight words there. It's short, it's to the point. Um, he has eight words. I will tell you right now that I have over 2,500 words. I'm a little disappointed in my ability to condense things. But isn't it amazing that God said, Here's your message, Jonah. Yet in 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And what happened? They repented, didn't they? It says, from the king to the children, from the great to the small, even the animals, they put sackcloth on the animals. I'm not sure if the sheep knew why they were being covered up. They were probably upset they didn't get to drink. But the repentance was so great that it didn't matter who was in the city, they repented. Uh, Jake, I, I don't know if, if you want to answer this out loud, but would you love to deliver an eight-word message and have the whole town repent? Hmm? Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? So um, here's, the, uh, here's the king's response. I love the idea that turn from their wicked ways and the violence which is in their hands. He recognized the sin. He recognized the violence that was in that environment, in that society. And then he says, who knows? God may turn and relent. Pretty powerful from a king that was known to be brutal and from a society that was known to be brutal. So, what was God's response? Pretty straightforward, wasn't it? I love the end of it. It said, he, didn't, he did not do it. He relented. Pretty cool. Pretty amazing. But I do have a question for you. Uh, it said, in, in this case, God relented. Does God always relent well in all honesty you could spend a message or two on this topic uh, but let's just quickly look at a couple of things in the book of Jeremiah we get the opposite of what just happened in Nineveh it says that uh, you have forsaken me declares the Lord you keep going backward and to me that's the key you keep going backwards. So I will stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I am tired of relenting. Now he said this to his own people, to the people of the southern tribes of Judah. And we know that not, uh, during Jeremiah's uh, ministry, his prophecy, he saw Jerusalem become o completely overtaken by the Babylonians. Wiped out. Just demolished. So in that case, God didn't relent. And if you notice, it says they were going backwards. Let's look a little bit farther in Jeremiah, though. It says, If that nation which, against which I have spoken turns itself from evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I have planned for it. I have planned to bring on it. So if you notice in these two verses, these two contrasting verses, one group is turning they're back on God. They're turning away from God. And one group is turning towards God. God relents for those that turn to Him. But those who reject Him, He does not relent. 
Often we hear of God's love and His grace and His compassion, and we're going to talk about that a lot this morning. But for God to be just, there has to be the opposite of that as well. There has to be a punishment for sin. We're going to talk about that more as we go. And here's one passage that uh, I really appreciate and really love. Uh, In the book of Joel, it says, And rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. But do you see what Joel was trying to get across? God speaking through Joel? I think most of you are familiar with this, but the idea of tearing or or rending your clothes was an outward sign of repentance, of sorrow. But Joel is warning the people, if you only rip your clothes, but don't fix your heart, don't submit your heart, you have done nothing of value. But then he says, now return to the Lord your God, for He is what? He is gracious, He's compassionate, He's slow to anger, He's abounding in loving kindness and relenting in evil. If we are willing to rend our hearts, to repent with our heart. All of the things that we love about God are ours to experience. So, um, as we think back to the narrative, we finished up with an amazing repentance, right? The whole city, boom! Boom! Eight words, everybody repents. Jonah was probably thrilled with that, wasn't he? Well, maybe we better read the rest of the the book here. So let's read chapter 4 together and find out what Jonah's response really was. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore... In order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life, for death is better than life. For to me, death is better than life. The Lord said, Do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen to the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be shade over his head and deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head, so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals? Is Jonah's response a bit surprising or amazing? Jonah is angry. He's a prophet. His job is to deliver God's Word and hope that people will respond to that Word. When they do, he gets angry. Hard to understand. That's pretty amazing to me. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but last week I mentioned that I didn't think Jonah had a, a good grasp of God in some cases because he tried to run and get out of God's presence. I think that's pretty, pretty foolish. 
But today he tells us in chapter 3 and 4, he says, here's why I ran. I knew you were a loving God that was going to forgive them and I didn't want you to forgive those people. He knows God pretty well, actually. He predicted exactly how God would react based on God's character. I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, in Jonah 4.2, I knew that you were gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness. Do, um, do you believe that God is abundant in loving kindness? We're going to talk about that here as we go for the next few minutes. Uh, but just think about Jonah's complete and utter belief in God's character. And that's why he was so adamant that he didn't want to go. Hmm. So, um, I mentioned the word loving kindness here. Uh, there's a um, word in Hebrew. Um, if we Englishize it or Americanize it, hesed is an easy way. It probably sounds a lot harsher, uh, a little bit of nasal twang in there. Um, I will do a terrible job at pronouncing it, so I'm just going to leave it at hesed for now. But this word shows up a few hundred times, at least a couple hundred times in Scripture, in, especially in the Old Testament. And it's one of those words that when we translate it into English, we kind of go, ah, I'm not sure exactly what to do with it. Look at all the different, and this is just a partial list. In some cases, this word is translated mercy, or kindness, or loving kindness, or goodness. And you get the idea, all of those different ways to translate it, depending on the context and so on. But when it's used in context with God, with Yahweh, it's almost always translated loving kindness, and it's almost always pointed at God's character. God's character is one of loving kindness. So as I said, it's listed, used 100 times, 200 times. I think we're going to go through every one this morning together. How's that sound? Actually, I picked just a couple. And for most of these, you are well familiar. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven or above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to, the thou to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, I'm sure you all probably picked up, up on this. This section, this passage comes from God delivering the Ten Commandments to His children, to the people of Israel. And in some cases, it can cause a bit of challenge when we get to the part about God visiting the sins of multiple generations, three or four generations. Because in other parts of Exodus and in Ezekiel and other passages in Scripture, it also says and prohibits, uh, one example would be for putting to death the son for his father's sin or the father for his son's sin. So in this passage, if we look at it briefly or quickly, it seems to say God is going to punish generation after generation. And then later in Exodus it says, no, you, you can't punish the son for the father's sin. So how does that conflict? How do we work through that? Well, I believe that this passage is, is a clear warning that sin has consequences. And often those consequences impact those who didn't do or participate in the sin. Uh, I think we see examples of this all around us. Think of someone who commits a crime and is sent to prison. Is their family impacted by that person being incarcerated? 
did the family do anything wrong? Well, we don't know for sure, but let's just assume they didn't. So in that case, the sins of, the, let's say he's the father, the sins of the father impacts his children and his family. Think of it another way. Um, if someone in the home abuses alcohol or abuses, uh, physically abuses a spouse, everyone in the home is impacted by that, not just the person who sins. Um, I have a personal example. I have uh, my, my grandfather had a father who was an alcoholic, and in many cases my dad got in the way of between his parents when his dad was trying to beat up his mom. And sometimes it was the opposite. When my great-grandfather was in a rage and trying to beat up my grandfather, my great-grandmother would get in between. Yeah. And so I, I listen, I read this and think of those personal stories. Uh, my, uh, my grandfather accepted the Lord and he was able to break that chain of abuse. But as I speak with my dad and think of my grandpa, he bore the scars of that experience for the rest of his life. His father sinned, but it impacted his life. And I think that's exactly what the Lord is talking about here in Exodus. He's saying sin causes consequences, and sometimes those consequences spill out, and rarely does sin impact only the person who sins. So, let's look at the last part of that verse, though. What did it say? That it extended to thousands? In some cases, in many uh, translations, it doesn't say thousands, it says a thousand generations. So I, I, I thought, well, let's figure that out for a second. If, if, if a thousand generations is how long God's loving kindness lasts, and three or four generations is how long the consequences of sin last, let's just say 20 years is a generation. It could be more, it could be less. But 20 years, that means... 80 years, maybe 100 years for the consequences. How many years does it mean for God's loving kindness? What's 20 times 1,000? You guys are great at math. 20,000, all right. How long has it been since these words in Scripture were written? 3,000, 3,500, something like that. When, when the... When the Ten Commandments were given as the Israelites were leaving Egypt, we don't have an exact date. God didn't write it down on the tablets anywhere that we know of anyway. But we know it's been a few thousand years. Three or four at the most. So here's what's amazing to me. When God wrote this, and for us it seems like forever ago, we still are not even halfway through this expanse of when God's loving kindness will last. Let's put it this way. None of us have anything to worry about of outliving God's loving kindness. How's that sound? And I think back to, um, remember when Jesus and his disciples, and the disciples, I think Peter specifically said, Lord, should I forgive this person seven times? And in Peter's mind, and in the culture then, seven times, it's like, wow, that is really generous, Peter. And what did Jesus say? Not seven, but 70 times seven. So again, math skills, 490, right? Do you think Jesus really wanted them to go one, two, three, 302, 300? No. What was his point? Just... Don't even worry about it. Just forgive them. Don't count. Do you think that's how God's loving kindness works? Is God going one generation, two generations? Getting close pretty soon. I don't have to no more loving kindness. No. God is telling us, look, guys, His loving kindness is so much bigger than what you'll ever need, what you'll ever experience, or what you'll ever need in your experience. You don't have to worry about it ending. 
That's God's Hesed love for us. And Jonah said, Lord, I know that's the kind of love you have. I know you're going to forgive them, and I hate those people. You can't forgive them, so I won't go. And then he goes, and guess what God does? He works, and they are forgiven. They repent. So, I was kind of critical of Jonah last week. I think he's right on understanding God this week. Doesn't always do it with the right attitude, maybe, but he certainly does understand God, doesn't he? Let's look at one more verse that talks about God's Hesed love. Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and not let the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Isn't that a pretty amazing verse? Don't boast in the things of this world. If the Lord is giving you a gift, don't boast in your gift. What are we to boast in? And do you notice boast in the understanding of His love and His justice? Do you think that a goal for us to understand God's loving kindness and show it would be a pretty amazing goal for us to have? So, even though Jonah didn't want to, even though he reluctantly obeyed, he spoke those eight words and God showed his Hesed love to the people. Jonah's response is still one of anger. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? So let's go back to Jonah's response for a little bit. Um, if you remember reading through, twice God asked jo- uh, Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry? I love the good reason part there. How many of us get angry without a good reason? Here's, uh, here's the deal. I won't ask you to respond if you don't make me respond. Is that, is that a deal? It's, isn't it easy to say, oh, I, I have a righteous anger, the kind that Jesus had when He cleaned out the temple. Or How often do we really express a uh, <clears throat> righteous anger? Again, please don't count in my life. So God asked him, Did he have a, does he have a good reason? Uh, as I read through and studied and lurked on this this week, I kept thinking, my goodness, you could grab just a few of those, couple of those verses and look into Jonah's response and you could spend a whole Sunday doing nothing but looking into those responses. He wants to die again. This man has a death wish. Hmm? But let's look at just a couple of things um, in his response. First, and... Let's pop in here. Jonah showed more compassion to a plant that lived for one day than he did for a city of possibly a million people. Isn't it really easy to quickly condemn him for that? How could you, Jonah? That's so foolish. That's so selfish. That's so arrogant. So how is our compassion? How is your compassion? How is my compassion? Let's just combine these two together. I think we need to talk to them as we do with both in front of us. Again, going back to Jonah, he would prefer to die 
rather than rejoice in the amazing repentance of the people of Nineveh. Lord, I'm so mad at you for saving these people. Just kill me now. I want to die. And again, it's really easy. You know, in fact, I just did it, didn't I? I condemned Jonah for his death wish, for showing a lack of compassion. And I also wonder what's our real desire, what's our real concern for those that don't know Jesus as Savior? Are there more than a million people in this world that need to know Him? Are there more than a million people in Colorado that need to know our Lord? Luckily, we're in Cedar Edge. There's not more than a million in Cedar Edge. We're no, we know that pretty, pretty safely, don't we? But are there people in our own town that need to know our Savior? So, this is these two together. What's our compassion look like? And do we really have concern for those that don't know our Lord and Savior? It's so easy to condemn Jonah and his response But we have to be very careful that our own response isn't similar. I don't know about you, but as I watch my children grow up and watch their, they develop and they they get, well, more sophisticated at doing things they're not supposed to do. Anybody ever notice that? And then you say, well, I'm glad I'm not like them. I'm glad I'm an adult and grown up. And then I go, am I just becoming more sophisticated even than my kids about doing things that I shouldn't be doing? And again, you don't have to answer that, and please don't answer about me. Isn't it the way that we look at our kids and say, or somebody younger than us, and we say, oh, well, they're not been sure. They, 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 they make mistakes. But we don't use the same lens back on ourselves. And we often excuse those things. So, um, when Jonah responded in a way that none of us ever should, we need to stop before we condemn and look at our own responses to those around us and our compassion that we share. So in my mind, and you can, again, this might be a little bit harsh, but in my mind, Jonah was a rebellious, reluctant, and remorseful missionary. But guess what? God still used them. Isn't that amazing? And He used them to bring this message to a Gentile country, a Gentile empire. And as far as we can tell and as we look through Scripture, um, it's the, He's the only prophet that His main job, in fact, the only job we know of for Jonah, His only job was to go and tell people that weren't Jewish. All the other prophets had messages, at least some of the messages, back to their own people. So, maybe that's why Jonah was so mad. He goes, hold it, why do I have to go to them? This other prophet, they got to go to their... I don't know, maybe Jonah did that. I might do that. But it's pretty amazing to me that Jonah had such a terrible attitude. His rebellious nature was just on full display. And God still sent him and used him and caused a great revival. There's another um, missionary that I'm reminded of uh, who is associated with both the name Jonah and the city of Joppa. So, let's um, see if this name might ring a bell. Simon, Simon Peter, and in, uh, in Matthew, seven, or, sorry, Matthew 16, remember, this is the passage where Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus' response back is, Simon, son of Bar-Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed this to me, but God alone. So, what does Bar-Jonah mean? Well, if you're looking at the screen, you already know. You can cheat. Bar means son. So, Simon, now Peter, Simon was the son of 
Jonah. I would assume that since Andrew is Peter's brother, that was his dad as well, right? And I don't want to make too much of this that Simon, that Peter's dad was named Jonah, but I do want to bring up an event that deals with Joppa. Where did, uh, remember, Jonah went down to Joppa, tried to escape? Do you think it'd be really ironic of the Lord to have the fish spit Jonah right back up on the same dock where he got into the boat? We don't know if that happened or not, but I've always wondered where the, the fish spit him out. But Joppa was the city where, where Peter, I'm sorry, where Jonah tried to run. And um, when we look at Acts chapter 10, there's a really interesting account. And the account starts with Peter in Joppa. He has a vision, and these sheets are coming down, and it's full of animals that Peter would never eat. They're unclean. And the Lord says, kill and eat. Peter, Peter says, no way, Lord. I've never, I've never broken your rules before. I'm not going to start now. And on the third time, the Lord says, hey, Peter, don't make unclean what I have made clean. Peter's thinking about that, probably specifically to the food. And then here's what happens next. There's a gentleman. He's a Roman centurion. He lives up in Caesarea. He sent a group of his servants down to Joppa to get Peter because he wants to hear the gospel. And as soon as Peter comes down off the roof, these men are knocking at the door. And I think Peter went, Ah, that's what that vision was about. It wasn't just about the food, because God wants Peter to go to Cornelius' house, and this is the first time in Scripture that there was a specific effort to go straight to the Gentile people. So if you think about Jonah, he was told to go to Gentiles and preach a message. And now Peter is given the opportunity to go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel. So let's pause for just a second here. You probably already know the outcome, don't you? You've read the end of the story. But let's think about something before that. Why was Jonah so adamant not to go to Nineveh? Because the people that were there were their mortal enemies. And he didn't want them to be saved. So think of Peter, a Roman centurion, a Roman military officer in charge of a platoon of people, a platoon of soldiers, says, I want you to come to my house. The enemy just sent you a note that said, please come visit me and share the gospel with me. Peter had every reason to go, hmm, I don't know if I want to go there. Let's, let's even take out the idea of being unclean to meet with, with Gentiles. But the Romans were cruelly ruling Peter's people. It was a harsh rule. It was not fun to be under Roman rule. And oh, by the way, a few years earlier, those, that same Roman authority had allowed and in fact aided the death of his Lord and Savior Jesus. So if you were asked to go and share the gospel with someone who was number one, oppressing you, and number two, had killed someone that you loved dearly, what would be your first response? Might be some hesitancy there, huh? Did uh, Peter hesitate? No. We don't have time to read it all, but if you go and look at Acts 10, Peter gives them a place to stay the night, feeds them. The next day he heads off to Cornelius' house. And the first expansion into the Gentile world in a, in a uh, dedicated sense was made. And I'll be honest, uh, I'm not sure about you, I'm pretty glad that Gentiles are allowed to seek our Lord. Right? 
Because if not, I don't know all of your backgrounds. Let's just put it this way. None of my family tree gets anywhere close to a Jewish line. So I would be out. So here's a few more things that I find amazing. I find it interesting and maybe again amazing that God showed loving kindness to the city of Nineveh because He knew that within just a couple of generations of Jonah being there, those people would come down and wipe out the northern tribes of Israel. Probably not, probably two or maybe three generations. And that same city, that same empire wiped out all, north, all ten northern tribes. Why did God send somebody to them when He knew that was what was going to happen? And a few generations later, God also knew this before it happened, the Babylonian Empire came in and just completely wiped Nineveh off the map. And in fact, if, if you head to, uh, as I think I mentioned last week, uh, Mosul, Iraq, and you go out of town a little bit, you can see where they're digging, and they have to dig pretty hard to find Nineveh. It's there, but nobody has lived in it since Babylon wiped it out. Why, why did God, knowing that would happen, still show them loving kindness? I'll be honest, I don't know, but here's something that it does remind me. It reminds me that if I have all of that in my mind, far be it from me or from us to decide who gets shown loving kindness and who doesn't. Not my job. I don't want it. Although every now and then I try to go out and grab it because I think I know better than God. So we may not understand God's purpose, but we can understand His character. And just like Jonah said, I know God's character is one of loving kindness. We can depend on that as well. So, to finish up this morning, I just have a couple of questions and thoughts for you. Have you repented of your sins like the people of Nineveh? I won't say that's God's sign, but... <laughs> have you repented of your sins the way that the people of Nineveh repented? If your answer might be no, might I suggest that today is the perfect day to repent? Remember when Jonah went, how many days did it take of his preaching to begin the repentance? Just one day. Today is the right day. And then a question for all of us. Are you amazed by God's loving kindness. And now the challenge. If you say that you are amazed and that you believe that that's true, do you, do I live in a way that shows that? Jonah provided a great example of how not to do it. I think those like Peter showed a much better example of how to do it. And I'll let you contemplate on those two. Let's, cl let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your loving kindness. And I'm afraid, Lord, that it is something that is easy to take um, for granted. It is easy to say we love and to say that we know your love, yet, Lord, we often don't act in a way that proves it. So Lord, thank You for this small book in the Old Testament that reminds us of Your power and love and control. And Lord, thank You for providing the opportunity for repentance. Thank You for Your Son that died so that we could have full repentance or full forgiveness of sin. Lord, I'd ask that as we leave this building this morning, that you, will, that you will put deeply in our hearts the idea that you are 
a loving kind, you are a God of loving kindness, and that you want us to show that to others as well. In thy name, amen.